I am deeply moved to be standing at this pulpit today, invited as the preacher of Yanwan Church for the Sunday service. As a pastor who has been in ministry for a long time, I know how significant it is for a senior pastor to entrust another pastor with the pulpit of their church Sunday service due to the senior pastor having a, a schedule overseas. And it's not something easy. It's a decision made with great caution. However, senior pastor Reverend Nchu Chang of Yewon Church, due to special overseas occasion, has interested me with this pulpit today. First and foremost, I am grateful to God and Pastor Chang for giving me this precious opportunity. And so before starting this sermon, I wanted to share briefly a little bit about myself as a testimony. I was born in Bosong, Jeollanam region, and moved to Seoul with my family in the fourth grade. And after completing my education, and while in seminary, I joined the military and served in Busan, the base there. And in 1977, I started my ministry, founding a church in Yosu, Jeollanamdo, where I pioneered a church. So I pioneered the church in two places. And I did my ministry there for nine years. And after that, I came up to Dongducheon and then I was there for about three years and seven months, and then I served in a church in Jungnanggu. It was a church that had been around for 17 years, even when I took over, and but I did my ministry there for 33 years. And on December 25, 2022, one and a half year ago from today, I retired from 45 years of ministry and was honored as a senior pastor and a meritorious pastor by the Gyeonggi Presbytery. So now I am a retired pastor currently. Despite my shortcomings, I served as the moderator of our denomination's General Assembly But during my second term, in August 2021, I underwent surgeries to remove bladder cancer and a kidney cyst. But after surgery, I, my body was not very, my body wasn't in a very good condition. And in December of the same year, I had to have surgery for lung can cancer. And then, I had to undergo chemotherapy, and but it wasn't that effective. And so a year later, my bladder cancer reoccurred again. So I had to go another under another surgery. And afterwards, for about one year, I am undergoing regular chemotherapy and regular checkups. I had to go under a year of chemotherapy, and now I'm undergoing regular checkups, and my prognosis is quite positive and allowing me to maintain relatively good health. So last year, despite there being no mandatory retirement age in our denomination, I made a decision to retire at the end of year 2022 because of these health issues. And so if, if it is possible, it's ideal to be healthy and live long without illnesses. And even to this day, our Reverend Chung does push-ups and that's good. But there are times where there are unexpected trials or illnesses that we face. However, these incidents only lead us to a deeper and richer, richer place of grace in our walk of faith. Through before I 
struggled with my health, I had never once been admitted to a hospital. Up until the age of 70, I was healthy and maintained my health that way. But afterwards, through my battle with illnesses, through those struggles, I received much grace from God. If any of our believers and members here are suffering from illnesses or trials and suffering, I bless you in the name of the Lord to overcome with the greater grace that the Lord gives. It is good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. Psalms 119.71 The author of Psalm says this, says that it is good for me that I was afflicted. And in Job 42 verse 5, it says, I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes sees you. Through that suffering and trials, a greater faith and a greater grace of God was able to be experienced. During my 34 years of ministry at the Mainline Church, I faced many conflicts regarding participation in the Tarapang movement. After I had I took over a church, it grew rapidly, and we did. A, and back then, we did a 3,000 evangelism movement. And it was a church that had a 300 attendee church, but then back then, the, all churches were did a lot of great festivals centered on evangelizing and inviting a lot of newcomers, and that's how I used to do my ministry also as well. But afterwards, I started to face conflicts in, within the church because of my participation in the Dharapa movement. And many key church officers left the church. And in the final years of my ministry, although I was nominated as a Mertus pastor, some church members within the church were incited against me because of the Dharapa issue and my health problems. And so I just quickly decided to retire. However, I never regretted accepting the Tarapang movement in our denomination. Why? Because Tarapang is not a heresy. This is a confession of my faith and conscience. I'm not saying that, of course, that Tarapang as an organization is perfect or without fault. Unlike when we discern churches, there are earthly churches and triumphant churches in, uh, and heavenly churches, and there are there are local churches and universal churches. There are there are categories of churches, but unlike the triumphant church and the universal church of God, that is without fault and perfect, but the earthly church, the secular church, as long as they're on earth, they can never be perfect. And that goes the same for Tarapang. Unlike the triumphant church in heaven, the earthly church continues to engage in spiritual battles against the forces of darkness. It is still in the present tense. Therefore, from a spiritual perspective, there may be casualties, noise, and discord. However, the important fact is that the Tarakbang movement is a biblical gospel movement and an undeniable evangelistic movement of God. And I firmly believe this. In fact, I have played a significant role in our denomination's history. And so I wanted to tell you a little bit about that. Recently, an elder named Yoon Gwang-shik, a representative of the Korean Christian newspaper, 
published a book entitled The Tarapang Movement is Biblical. And I've read it to myself too, and it's well organized. When the former Reformed General Assembly absorbed 17 presbyteries of the former Evangelism General Assembly to become our denomination, I was the one who initiated it. At that time, as the chairman of the General Assembly's Heresy Countermeasure Committee, I was tasked with researching and reporting on, and that task was given to me. And so because I was the chairman of the General Assembly's Heresy Countermeasure Committee, I had to research and report on the heresies nationwide. And with uh, I had a lot of materials and documents concerning that. And based on that, I had various know-hows of, of how to carry out that task. And what was my conclusion? It was that while the general evaluation of Pastor Ryu Guangsu's Darabang Evangelist movement in the Christian community is mixed, it cannot be considered heretical from a biblical or doctrinal perspective. It wasn't a heresy. I've also seen the many criticisms that other churches and denominations made about the Starpa movement. And so at the core of it, Reverend, the main criticism was that Reverend Yu talked about demons in the pulpit and the pre, in his preachings. And so, but other denominations, they say that the working of demons are separate, are separate work, and it's not biblical. And, and he said that he said that the, oh, he, uh, one of the main criticisms was that they believed that de, they said that tar, the DARPA movement, that Reverend Yu talked about that demons are simply a soul, the souls of unbelievers, but he's never said that once. And so we've seen that in, in this DARPA movement, the core of them is to fight against the evil spirits and the spirits of darkness. And not once do they claim that demons are simply souls of dead unbelievers. And so upon receiving this report, the General Assembly decided to integrate the Evangelism General Assembly. And subsequently, the theological stance was clearly established through the Theological Committee report by Chairman Pastor Na Yong Hua. And he asked for me, he asked me to give him the documents that I have, I had on this and later on that's how the report was made and later the christian council of korea formed ver verification committees with experts from each denomination twice and decided to lift the heresy designation from that was on that was placed on the dharma movement and we've and the conclusion was made officially that Darbang is not a heresy. So some may think, even after going through all this, aren't we still not completely free from the heresy dispute? Yes, that is true. Even in my own church that I was doing my ministry, I had to face those accusations as well. And so I feel that, however, in most cases, unless it is advent advantageous to call the Tarapang heretical for one's own interest, politically or intentionally, they may say and repeat that Tarapang is a heresy. However, but when you look at it biblically, theologically, logically, a genuine believer does not consider it heretical, and there are no firm evidence and, and documents to prove so. And if you do have them, please show them to me. 
And so I shared this at length because the reason is because it's important. You may say, are you saying all this because you did this? You want some recognition for your efforts? Yes, that's right. I do want some acknowledgement. Even Apostle Paul in the Bible said this to, concerning figures like Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaicus, the first fruits of Achaia. He said, therefore, acknowledge such men. Sometimes you've got to acknowledge them. I'm not asking you to acknowledge me and recognize me, but there are those who labor and who devote themselves around us, and there are times where we go dismissing them. Let us at this time look at the person beside us and follow after me. I'm sorry I didn't recognize you this far. Look at them, look at them. Don't just say it. Let's say it one more time. I'll start recognizing you from now on. Although I don't know the exact date, I kind of had anticipated that someday I would be standing at the pulpit of Yewon Church. To be more precise, I had wished for it. Do you know why? When we talk about Reverend Eunjie Chung, he is one of the leading figures in our association and general assembly. He applies and develops Pastor Reverend Yu Kwang Su's Tarapang Evangelist Movement and Strategy to Yewon Church, the church that he leads, and led it to become today's super church. But I've always wondered why is it Reverend Chung and Ju? Because there are many other pastors inside the denomination aside from R Pastor Chung. And, but you know, he has a very powerful speech and he's eloquent and sometimes when he becomes so passionate, you can notice a Kyungsung Do accent. In fact, even from my perspective as a pastor, he has qualities that make him enviable as a pastor and as a minister. And before his dedication to pastoral ministry, he already was an elder and prominent figure in the CE movement within the Hapdong denomination. And so, and I myself was also in the Hapdong denomination. And when I heard how he used to, he, all his activities back then, he, he was quite something. He also experienced the Holy Spirit and still considering the wide and extensive ministry, spectrum, and mission boundaries of Pastor Chung and Yewon Church. Sometimes when I go overseas, when I meet pa pastors or missionaries overseas, I ask them, how did you come here? They, they always say, oh, they, I meet these pastors and missionaries in the airport and ask them, how, how did you go about to the country? And they say, oh, I'm a missionary that was commissioned from Yewon Church. And so I can't help but wonder, why does God use Reverend Chung this way? And recently I found an answer to that. And He, Pastor Chang, has published many expositions, but among them, it was because of two books written by Pastor Chang. Of course, even before that, I started to understand and accept, saying, oh, that's why. But the first book that helped me realize this was the 66, it was the, the first book was called Christ in the Scriptures, where with a subtitle, meeting Jesus Christ through the 66 books in the Bible. And he says, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me. The Bible bears witness to Jesus Christ. Jesus is the Christ, the, sol the solution to all problems. Even if there are 100 questions, there is only one answer, and that's Jesus Christ. Even if there are maybe 1,000 questions, there is only one answer, and that's Jesus Christ. And even to the 10,000 problems of life, it is one answer, and that is Jesus Christ. May you believe this. 
And it was through this exposition, Christ in the scriptures, that I realized that because the answer to everything is Christ. There is no need for us to dwell any longer on the introductory life. But who tells us this fact? It is the Bible. The answer is in the Bible. What kind of book is the Bible? It's the book that records the Word of God. In verse today, today's passage says, and how the Word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. You know the last chapter of Acts in Acts chapter 28, verses 30 to 31, it says, Paul lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. There was no one that could stop Paul because the core of Paul's ministry was always the word of God. Do you feel that your walk of faith is difficult and hard? May you receive the word of God. There was a student who took an exam about the content of geography. And the question was, write about the eight provinces of the East. And the student answered, the eight provinces of the East are in the East and the details are in the book. That's correct. The details are all in the book. In the, the Bible, which is the word of God, everything is there. And I have received much grace from Pastor Chung's Christ in the Scriptures expository book. And, you know, there are other books that ha have been written in that perspective as well. But from a pastoral perspective, The, this book was easy to understand because it was based on lectures that had simplified the core contents of the Bible for the church. And another book was the Declaration of Liberation, which was an expository on the Sermon of Romans. And this book is unique as it is edited from his handwritten manuscript. It spans over 300 pages, and I received tremendous grace from it. It's true. I also love the Book of Romans and have heard many expository sermons on it. And I've also preached on Romans several times myself in the church that I served. However, Pastor Chung's Declaration of Liberation integrates Reverend Yu's Tarapang messages while also maintaining the salvation message of Reformed theology. And so th with that, it presents a clear guide to Christian salvation and life. I was so moved by the message that I, and I, I thought, oh, I wish that I was the only one who started, you know, who only read this. And so starting la about the end of last year, I started typing out the sermons. I'm not very good at typing, but still, As I saw how the there were messages that I could give from that or I could take from that, I started typing them so that whenever I get a chance, I could use them in my messages. And no one is giving me money to do this. I do it because I like it and I receive grace from it. Through this process that I just explained, I realize why God uses Pastor Chung so preciously. And even this morning, I asked one of our pastors. He, I saw that he, in the book that he writes in his handwriting, it's his handwriting. I asked him, is that really his handwriting? And they said, yes, it is. When a preacher prepares their sermon, and I've done this many years, so I know this, to, for the preacher to prepare that sermon, to pray and to think about the spiritual state of the church and 
to have to think about all of that and consider all of that, it takes a lot of thinking and time. But that devotion and that dedication, you know, I don't really have the chance to really listen to Reverend Chung's messages to like you do. I do listen to Reverend Ryu's message often, but I don't really have the opportunity to listen to Reverend Chung's message like you do. Anyway, I thought that Yewon Church, who has Pastor Reverend Chung as a senior pastor, you all are very blessed. It's really amen. I'm not saying that the church is big. I'm not talking about the number of church members. Even if the church may be big or there may be a lot of church members, there are many churches that do not have the gospel. However, there are not many churches that are within that maintain the re Reformed theology and the biblical foundations that and still hold on to the gospel. And so it is such a precious message for you to be able to receive. It's, it's a blessing and may you be able to give thanks. And so, and now I see why Yewon Church is a forward base for world evangelization and a platform for the two through seven nations. But there's something important here. Realizing and knowing something isn't enough. If you've realized and you have come to understand, there must be actions and that follow and you need to let the person know. Two weeks ago, there was a national pastor's retreat in Sokcho and I had a brief opportunity to miss Pastor Chang and I told him in that brief time, Pastor, I said, I received so much grace from your handwritten expository sermon in Romans. I've been typing it out and using it as a ma message because I've been receiving so much grace. Pastors also appreciate compliments, and Pastor Chung was no exception. And so he appreciated the compliments. And so why wouldn't someone be pleased to hear that their book brought grace upon them? But the broad point is you have to express it. You have to confess it. I love you. I respect you. Pastor, I received grace. You have to confess it. And so let's say that a boy and a girl were dating. But they only felt that in their hearts and they never confessed it to each other. And they acted like they pretended like it's not. But because of that, the girl ended up getting married. And on the first night, she cried and cried. And because the girl in her heart, she only loved one person. But on the outside, she did, never pretended like it was not. You shouldn't pretend like it's not. You have to confess that you love. Even when it comes to our walk of faith in our life, it's the same. There are things that we must say, whether it's to your family, your children, or maybe to your fellow believers. To be able to confess when you can is very important. This person is mine. But why aren't you able to confess that? You must be able to confess it. And so to the pastors and to people around you, may you confess this. On the way back from Sokcho, I muttered to myself, I said, Oh, I, it would be nice if Yewon Church could invite me so that I could express this and express my feelings a bit. And I was muttering this to myself. But the next day, the pastor's secretary called me 
And he asked me, Pastor, if you're available on Sunday, June 2nd, could you deliver the sermon for the second service at Yewon Church? What do you think I said? I said, yes, I'm, I'm available. And you know what I was saying inside? I was already waiting for this because I was waiting. I must also see Rome. I must visit Rome also, he said. Not business. No tour, no study. It wasn't that he was going to travel. It wasn't that he was going there to do some research. But he said, I must also see Rome. It was Paul's desire and it was his resolution. If you look at verse 21 of his passage, during his third missionary journey throughout Asia and Greece, Paul says, Now after these things had been accomplished, Paul resolved in the spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia and go to Jerusalem, saying, After I've been there, I must also see Rome. Here, after these things had been accomplished, it connects to verse 20, So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. If you look at Acts, We see that the works of the Holy Spirit in three main, mainly in three parts. And so we see that first on, upon the early church, and then second, it is also in the family of Cor Corinth, and then in Ephesus. And after experiencing this great revival of the Holy Spirit in Ephesus, Paul was captivated by a new vision because there were great works of God that were taking place. And he meditated on the living and active works of God in the field. He planned to report his mission's work from his third journey in Jerusalem after passing through Macedonia and Achaia and then proceed to Rome. Paul, as a missionary to both Jews and Gentiles, had already led many to the Lord through three mission journeys. However, he was not satisfied and desired to preach the gospel to even more people in more places. Here we discover Paul's burning sense of mission. Paul was a missionary strategist. He saw the world and recognized the importance of Rome. Rome at that time was a center of the world. And many people flocked to Rome and he saw the value of Rome and because he knew that by addressing Rome, he would be addressing the world. He believed that if the gospel was preached in Rome, it could quickly spread to every region of the world. What we learn from Paul is that we need a strategy for evangelism. Where is a place like Rome today? It is the world evangelization of two through seven nations and 5,000 unreached tribes. And when we, what was the Rome that the Apostle Paul saw? To understand this, we must look into our identity, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. That's what it says in the Bible. Missions must go to the ends of the earth. What kind of mission reaches the ends of the earth? The end of the earth refers to the furthest place from where you are. Where, what is the furthest place for you? For Paul, a first century Christian, the furthest place geographically was Spain. Romans 15, 23, but now since I no longer have any room for work in these regions and since I have longed for many years to come to you whenever I go to Spain. Romans 15, 28, when therefore I have completed this and have delivered to them what has been collected, I will leave for Spain by way of you. For Europeans, 
The Mediterranean was the world itself at that time, and with at its center was Rome. Up until this point, Paul had already extensively preached the gospel in the Eastern Roman Empire using Antioch as his base. So what all he what was left was to preach in the Western Roman Empire because preaching the gospel in the Western Roman Empire would mean that he had pre preached the world, the gospel to the world. But there was a mountain that had to be overcome to spread the gospel to the Western Roman Empire. And that mountain was Rome. And so for Paul, the end of the earth was not only a geographical concept, but also a place of the greatest persecution for Christians, a place of spiritual and emotional distance. And that was Rome. I must also see Rome. The following night, the Lord stood by him and said, Take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome. He receives God's word. If there was Rome for Paul, then where is the Rome of my life? Where is the Rome of your life? From in that sense, the furthest end of the earth for me, my room, could be myself. It may seem like I am closest to myself, but often I could be furthest from myself. It may seem that the person that knows me the best is me, but often I may know myself the least. And the person I hate the most and the biggest enemy is not someone far away and distant, but could be myself. Jesus also said, and a person's enemy will be those of his own household. And Paul also confessed that the person closest, but also furthest from him, was himself. 1 Corinthians 9.27 says, But I disciplined my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Traveling the world, preaching and evangelizing to many people and doing missions, but have I received the gospel? Have I accepted Jesus and become a new creation? Some people are hardened mission fields themselves, but yet travel around evangelizing. How can a missionary live like that? What kind of mindset does a missionary have to do such things? Are they really believers of Jesus? How can a pastor live like that? How could an elder be like that? The closest, but actually, in reality, the furthest mission field could be oneself. Believers, may you today always confirm and correct your identity. Paul constantly checked his identity. In Romans 11, he says, I am a he I am an Israelite. I am a descendant of Abraham. I am a member of the tribe of Benjamin, and I am an apostle to the Gentiles. And then he confesses, it is by, God, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And Paul also confesses, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ, only Christ who lives in me. And I live for inside the faith that believes in Jesus Christ who has died for me. Paul had a clear sense of identity. In the book, Declaration of Liberation by Reverend Chung, there are three core scriptures, Romans 8, 1 and 2. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. The title of that book is Declaration of Liberation, and I think it comes, it derives from this. 
And for another verse is for those who love God, He works everything for, the, for their good. Romans 8, 28. The unchanging covenant of God. I held on to that even while battling my illnesses. After undergoing major surgeries three or four times, do I look like a cancer patient? Be honest with me. But everyone who sees me like that, he says, they say, oh, you don't look like a cancer patient. And one other scripture, it's Romans 8, 38 verse 39. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. May you believe this in the name of the Lord. May you correctly know your identity. Apostle Paul, inside his life and mission, he prioritized his mission. He said, my mission is to run this race that the Lord has placed before me, and for that, I will not consider my life worthy. May the confession of Apostle Paul, I must also see Rome, this confession, become your confession and live with a clear Christian identity for the rest of your life and bring glory to God lifelong. I bless you in the name of the Lord. Father God, we thank you. May this Yewon family unity truthfully confirm their identity and see the ends of the earth, Rome. We pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.